Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we finish up our series on biodiversity conservation and actually finish up our series for AP Environmental Science. If you've been with us thus far, thanks for checking out all the videos. And in class, thank you for uh, participating and keeping with me this whole time. I might be back later on next semester with some videos on some other topic, but for now, we are done with AP Environmental Science, so let's go ahead and wrap up strong with legislation and conservation aimed at dealing with biodiversity. Things you need to know by the end of this video is to be able to explain legislation related to conservation, compare and contrast the single species versus ecosystem conservation strategies, and finally, describe different types of biodiversity preserves. Throughout this whole class, our big thing has been talking about the environment and all of the things that humans have done to impact the environment. And it's only fitting that we have finished up with biodiversity because in reality, it's going to be the biodiversity of this world that keeps us alive. So we need to look at what can we do in order to preserve and promote that biodiversity. We're going to start out by talking about efforts to protect and improve biodiversity through legislation. There's going to be a couple laws that you need to know. Then we're going to talk about a couple strategies. First law that you need to be aware of is the Marine Mammal and Protection Act. I got a picture of otters there because, well, they tend to be some of the cutest sea creatures. So came about in 1972. The basic law is, it's an American law, and it says that you are not allowed to kill or trade in marine mammals. So no killing marine mammals is going to include things like sea otters, but it also includes manatees and dolphins and whales and porpoises and orcas and things like that. But you are also not allowed to buy and sell their parts or extracts from the animals or anything that has been taken illegally from those animals. So no buying, selling, or killing of marine mammals. Next law to be aware of is the Endangered Species Act. It came out in 1973, so the early 70s were a good time for conservation. This is going to be coming on the heels of Earth Day and Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. But I digress. Endangered Species Act, 1973. It enforces that CITES treaty that we talked about the other day. Remember, CITES is the law. It's an international agreement that says no buying or selling or trading or killing of endangered species. So it enforces CITES. It also allows the government to purchase habitat of endangered species. So if you have an endangered species living in an area, the government has the right to purchase that habitat and set it up as a uh, biodiversity preserve or a preserve for this type of animal to protect that animal from being a, or going extinct or being further threatened by the misuse of its habitat. Now, the Endangered Species Act is often controversial because it restricts human activities. If you remember way back, I talked about a lot of times uh, developments have to put together an EIS, an Environmental Impact Statement. When they do that EIS statement, if it is found that endangered species live in an area, then a lot of times the developer will not be allowed to buy that land or build on that land because it would further threaten the species and go against the Endangered Species Act. So a lot of times conservation groups and development groups will be at odds with each other because the conservation group says we need to protect these animals and the development group says, hey, we need jobs and we need the right to develop this land for human use. So Endangered Species Act gets in the way of development sometimes and therefore is occasionally controversial. The last law to be aware of, or last agreement to be aware of, is the Convention on Biological Diversity. So many world countries got together in 1992 and they decided to put together a plan or an agreement or a treaty that had three aims. The first one was to conserve global biodiversity. The second one was to sustainably use biodiversity. And the third was shared genetic benefit or shared benefit from genetic resources. So this would be stuff that is taken from areas to make pharmaceuticals, um, genetically modifying organisms, etc. So it said, hey, we as a global community are going to push for these things. Unfortunately, there was an assessment done in 2000 based on their goals and they did not meet any of them. So it was a good idea, but enforcing it and making it happen has not been so successful. So with all this in mind, we need to talk about a couple of different conservation approaches. There's a species approach and there's an ecosystem approach. The single species approach essentially looks at a species and says, all right, we are going to work to protect this one species. It might include saving their habitat. It might mean capturing them and breeding them in captivity and then releasing them later on, but it's focused on that one species. The laws that I've just talked about are single species approach. They focus on specific species. But there's also an ecosystem approach which says, all right, let's protect this whole area. And in protecting this whole area, then we in turn protect all of the species living in that area. So 
focus one species or focus on a whole ecosystem. The rest of the video is going to be talking about the ecosystem approach to conservation. One of the major things that goes along with the ecosystem approach is designing preserves to take care of wildlife, to promote biodiversity, and to protect areas that could otherwise be threatened. Now, when these preserves are designed, <clears throat> the ideas of island biogeography and metapopulations come into play. Talked about these ideas way, way back. But essentially, island biogeography says that bigger islands have more biodiversity because there are more resources available and bigger islands that are closer to the mainland have more biodiversity because animals can move between the mainland and the island. Metapopulations looks at small populations that are connected to each other through corridors. So let me draw you a little illustration of what that looks like. A metapopulation would be looking at, let's say you've got cougars, and there's a population of cougars here, and there's one here, and there's one here. So they're all, they could be looked at as their own distinct populations, but they might have corridors in between them that they can move through. And so scientists will look at this whole thing as a metapopulation. The reason metapopulations are important is because the ability to move between areas protects from extinction. So let's say a disease comes through and wipes out this population. It's possible that this area could be recolonized by animals moving through the corridor to this area. And like I said, as far as islands go, big islands have lots of species. Smaller islands have fewer species close to the mainland usually equals more biodiversity too. So when scientists are putting together, when conservationists are putting together uh, biosphere reserves or conservation areas, they think about each of those preserves as an island and treat them as such. So the debate is often had, do we make one big preserve that protects a lot of animals and since it's bigger, it should act like a bigger island and have more biodiversity? Or do we make lots of smaller ones that are maybe connected to each other. And there is not necessarily a best approach to do this. It's going to be specific to the area and just know that the ideas of island biogeography and metapopulations are the theories that scientists and conservations use when designing these preserves for biodiversity. Last slide for the day to wrap up is talking about a specific type of preserve called a biosphere reserve. And these reserves recognize that humans want to use areas that have endangered species in them, but also recognizes the need to protect those species. So a biosphere reserve is set up such that in the middle of the preserve, you can see there is a core area. The core area has little to no human disturbance. That is where your most endangered stuff is. That's where your prime habitat is. And that area, maybe you might be able to have some like hiking or walking in it, but there is nothing that impacts the environment that goes on in that area. Outside the core area, there's a buffer zone. And the buffer zone is the area where humans start to be able to interact with the landscape. So in the buffer zone, you might have some research areas, you might have some education areas, you've got hiking and recreation stuff going on, but not much or anything by the way of development or logging. Transition area is where you start to see the ability to sustainably use land. You're going to see settlements start to pop up, more human habitation and business and commerce. So the idea behind this is that you're protecting that central area while still allowing humans to utilize some of the surrounding area and be able to experience the animals in that core area. And with that, we are done with conservation of biodiversity. We are done with your videos for AP Environmental Science. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.